Farm for Profit Podcast. Take a listen, have a blast. Farm for Profit Podcast. Learn about farming while having a laugh. Farm for Profit Podcast. What a fantastic venue to be down here in Houston, Texas, boys. We get to record live here at Commodity Classic 2024. We're going to have a lot of content from this show, but I'm excited for each and every one of the interviews. Dave, I feel like you might geek out on this one just a little bit. <laughs> Maybe. just a little. I'm geeking out on the booth we're in. Yeah. I mean, this is the largest vendor booth I've ever seen. It's the largest vendor booth that Commodity Classic has ever had. It's larger wow. than a football field. Is it really? Yep. They so said- you're saying Brock Purdy couldn't even throw the football from one end? To the other, oh, he's pretty good though. Do you it's think probably we, two football fields? Left. That's pretty big. That's pretty big. But nonetheless, we are here to have a conversation as a profit show to learn about maybe a tool that we can throw into our tool belt. And I think that's going to be one of the major focuses of the interviews that we put together down here. Uh, we we are excited to invite Eric Mueller, founder and CEO of Sour Legacy Farmland Fund. Mm-hmm. Does that have an acronym? Just a little. F- f- Slu- Sluff? Yeah. <laughs> Sluff. It, it, it's, uh, yeah, we call it LFF. But oh, there you it, go. I uh, like that. Legacy Farmland Fund. But it, and it's sower. I always, everybody oh, always likes to sour. say sour, but it is technically sower. It's, it comes from the uh, the icon on top of the Nebraska State Capitol building, the sower who's sowing uh-huh. seeds. So, yeah, that's where that comes from. Nice. So. Hey, that I makes love sense. that. That makes a lot more sense. I'm glad that you shared that. So, I like anything farmland, Tanner. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> you just, it, that's all you heard. <laughs> that's all I heard. Farmland. And, and, and like anything in egg, uh, you know, you sow the seeds. Sometimes it takes a while for, for fruits to sprout. Yeah. And and so it's I, we thought it was very appropriate for what we're trying to do here. I like so. it. Oh, this yeah. connects much more. I'm mm-hmm. glad that you put that explanation together. But look, before we get into <laughs> sower, Let's learn about Eric. Tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about your background. You bet. Yep. So I, I grew up on a farm in northeast Nebraska. Your your standard uh, corn, soybeans, alfalfa. We raised cattle. Had a cow calf operation. Uh, we raised hogs, for, uh, farrow to finish. Um, even milk. Uh, I think we had twenty five head of, of milk cows. So oh, he did it uh, all. Yeah. So we did a little bit of everything. Um, so once I uh, got through college, I uh, started into. The real estate brokerage world, uh, in, and specifically into farmland, and so uh, so my background's been farmland brokerage, much like uh, David. Um, I started conducting auctions around 2006. Uh, I joined Farmers National Company in 2010, and if you guys recall, that was when the the first major run up in value started yeah. happening. And so I, I walked in the door there, not knowing what kind of business was going to be out there. And instantaneously started conducting auctions for farm managers and brokers throughout the Farmers National uh, organization. And so through that whole process and witnessing, and David, I'm sure you'll be able to attest to this too. I witnessed so many times that a couple different things. One, farmland families have an issue, number one, with communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. And number two... The uh, the lack of estate planning and, and succession uh, planning for farmland fa- families is just uh, unbelievable. How how th- there wasn't anything in place. I'd ask questions like, you know, do you have any idea what your basis is? Do you know what your tax ramifications is if you sell this farm? And and so many times it came back of, you know, what's that? Yeah. What's that even mean? Um, and then on top of that, I would see over and over again farmland families being torn apart by this gift that grandpa and grandma worked their tails off passed it down and and you'd see in these auctions a a sibling in one corner of the room and another sibling in another corner of the room you'd come to the break and they're they're mad at each other one didn't want to sell one did and and so um so the having going through those those situations i I, it hit me like there's got to be a solution out there that we can come up with that's gonna that's gonna help those farmland families uh you know take care of or help take care of their succession and transition planning in a way that's equitable for all parties for all siblings for all family members and uh so that's what we did that's that's where we're at that's That's pretty cool we we put a a lot of (laughs) emphasis on that family dynamic we did two shows over a span of less than three weeks Mm -hmm. yeah because our listeners even think that that's important yeah we've done not just two shows i mean the last three years we've probably done seven or eight shows on on transitioning Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. it's a very tough 
subject, and no matter how much we talk about it, it doesn't seem to get any easier. It doesn't get no. any easier. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah, we keep trying to solve the world's problems, but uh, how, how is it talking with your brother and your dad, Corey? Oh, that's going good. We actually, I mean, you can't just do it all at once, yep. right? Like, you have to take small baby steps and start with a, a meeting, you know, whether it's weekly or monthly or quarterly, whatever. Yep. Um, just start the communication process. Have the tough conversations, mm-hmm. um, because if you don't, you, you know, you're only hurting yourself. Yeah. I, in, in our our family situation, nobody said anything ever. I didn't know, yeah. you know, I don't, I always didn't know if dad even had a plan. Huh. And and now, looking back, he really didn't. Up until a few years ago after my mom passed away, it's kind of like, uh, do we have anything in place? Well, we're looking into it. I'm well, like, oh, and Eric, okay. you alluded to it. You know, if you go back uh, even 15 years, go, go back to the 80s, uh, go, go even farther back, and, you know, we're, we were talking $500 an acre. The, the propensity of how much stuff we're actually talking about now, uh, if that's the word to use, is, is so much larger or greater. Now with uh, every farmer that had five, 600 acres uh, is all of a sudden 5 million, 10 million. Uh, are, the numbers just got a lot bigger and the risks got a whole lot bigger and the conversations got a whole lot tougher. Yeah, yeah. I had a, uh, a person ask the other day, you know, what's too small for our legacy fund? And I said, you know what? An 80 acre farm anymore is a million bucks. Yeah. So it just the, the value of these assets are just astronomical compared yep. to what, like you said, in, in the '80s. And, uh, so you went from brokerage, and then you started the fund. So tell me more about the fund. Yep. So we so I, we actually started an uh, equity fund okay. first. Um, both the ideas were, were kind of born in my brain at the same time, but I thought, uh, you know, there's only a handful of, of private equity farmland funds out there. Um, I got to. The privilege to be able to meet a lot of people in the industry, whether it's uh, the other funds, some of the other funds, uh, folks like David, uh, other brokers, lenders, and those types of folks out in in the industry. Um, and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to start my own fund. Um, you know, once I I stop doing farmland deals, uh, that's the end of my business, right? Mm-hmm. What do I get? What am I gonna pass down to my family? And I thought this will be a, would be a good way to to really help. Not only investors, but uh, but my family moving forward, and so so we I developed a uh, private equity farmland fund, um, at least what, the idea. What and that, is that? What is a private yeah. equity farmland fund? Sure. So uh, we take in investor dollars. So say you want to invest a fifty thousand or hundred thousand or five hundred thousand dollars, and you want to invest in farmland. Well, when we're just talking about uh, the value or the uh, you know the cost it is to go buy a farm, it's you, you can't buy it with, with less than a million bucks anymore. So, so what we're doing is pooling investor dollars, uh, and we're taking that those dollars and deploying that into U.S. farm uh, row crop farmland um, throughout the United States. And so, right now, currently, we've we've got about fifteen, almost six, sixteen thousand acres in seven different states. We manage that portfolio. Um, uh, we we kick out quarterly dif- dividends to our investors. Uh, there is a lockup period for those dollars to, to stay into the fund, but after a three-year period, then they can, if they want to redeem out, they can do that. And so, it's just a, a, pa- a way for investors to passively in, in invest in farmland. Mm-hmm. So it's like okay. the stock market almost. You could buy a stock of land, you know, yep. where if you got a hundred-acre field, you know, mm-hmm. one acre is one stock yep. kind of deal, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you can't buy the whole chunk, but you see the appreciation in land, you know, it's a good investment. You got fifty thousand dollars, you can. Right, invest into it. And right, you got dividends mm-hmm. from rent and all that kind of stuff. Right, so and and, yeah. and and the portfolio itself is diversified. Right, so yeah. we're in a lot of different areas, a lot of different crop types, and so uh, there's a lot of risk mitigation by by doing that that diversified portfolio. I'm sure there's quite a bit of Iowa ground in there because that'd be the best. <laughs> there's a little bit, but <laughs> but you know when we're talking about buying a farm and making it work financially, yeah. it's tough to do. Oh sure, in, in especially in a state like Iowa, um, you know a lot of our deal flow. W- does come from uh, landowners that want to sell and lease lease the farm back. Uh, that's yep. where a lot of our deal flow comes from. And in those situations, we're able to sometimes get in uh, at a price point that makes it work for us. You sure. know, for what the cash rents are coming back. So, guys that want to do, I call that sale lease back. So they're gonna we're gonna sell it. Uh, are they just trying to get more equity position or not equity position, cash position, so they can go buy another farm? Is uh, there, what, what's your what's your normal seller? Uh, but I would say that, and then also uh, folks that just need to, to get their balance sheets straightened out a little bit. Okay. Um, you know, just a little more cash into the operation, especially now when we're, we're going into this high, you know, we're in this higher interest rate environment. 
um, you know, banks are putting a little pinch on some of the guys. Yeah. And so it's a way for them to kind of cash out a little bit, but still keep farming the farm. Right. Right. Bankers. Well, you might have, <laughs> say, Dave, you might have a farm that's, say, 10 miles from the farm, and you like it, but it's not right across the street. Yep. And what if that farm comes up for sale? And you've always told yourself, if that thing comes up for sale, or maybe buy maybe during the farm transition, you got to buy your brother or sister yeah. out or something like that, and you need cash. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't want to lose acres that you're farming, so yep. you can sell it. What is it that, J.G. Wentworth? I it's my money, I want it now. It's my money, I want it now. You need a snappy jingle. There you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've been talking about that. We need to come up. You guys do that <laughs> yeah. sort of thing? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we would love to do that. Yeah. So, so we're kind of land fun. So we interrupted you to clarify what an equity fund was. So you started with the equity fund. Mm-hmm. And then what you do? Yeah, so we started with the equity fund. And, and actually, as part of the uh, structure of that fund, we were, we were trying to figure out a way um, for people to be able to contribute their farm into the fund instead of, instead of cash or instead of uh, mm-hmm. capital. Um, and it just, it just it was very complicated. And so we said, you know what, let's just do the, we'll do the equity fund first. Let's put the, the contribution fund on the shelf, and we'll pull that off and, and you know, put that together once we're up and running. So... So we got the equity fund up and running. Um, we're buying farms. We're raising capital. That continues to grow. Uh, we built a, a really good internal team of uh, analysts and, and uh, folks that, that are able to really efficiently manage that portfolio. And so then we uh, started, uh, you know, we revisited the, the legacy fund. And that's a, a land contribution fund. And, and really simply how that works, uh, a landowner can contribute their farm into the fund. Uh, based on the value of that farm, they will receive shares or units back. And so with those units, they're, they're much more flexible than, than that monolithic farm asset. Uh, if you want to do anything monetarily with the, with the farm, you've got to sell it. And that's really about your only option. And here, if you contribute the farm in, you have shares. And then with those shares, you can uh, pass them down. You can keep them and, and realize the return uh, that the farm is going to bring or the whole portfolio of farms will bring. Uh, you can gift those shares. Uh, you can you can do a multitude of, of things, just like you would if you own shares of stock in any company or business. And so that's what we try to do is is to make it uh, uh, basically monetize the asset. So when you say legacy fund, you're saying Corey owns a farm. Uh, for our listeners uh, that aren't maybe picking up yet, uh, Corey owns a farm, but he wants to liquidate some asset. He can sell it to the fund, or his contribution is his farmland. Right. He contributes the farm in, and then he's got shares. And those shares are based off the, the number of shares he get, he will receive. And he's based still off a farmer, the though, too. Yes. And so we'll talk about some of the carve-out rights, or the rights that, that, uh, that, carve a, out rights. that, okay. a, that a landowner uh can enjoy, uh, and we can roll right into that. If, if so if what, let's, let's hold on. Let's get the okay. clarification because you're you're about ready to allude to that. How do you determine how many shares they get? Right. So if, say you got a, a million dollar farm. It comes in. The the share units are worth a thousand dollars. You're going to get what about a hundred hundred units. Right. Yep. So it's based upon a set value mm-hmm. of what your farm. It's not a per acre share. It's not. If his 80 acres is worth something different than my 80, it's right. just based upon gross dollar Exactly. Yep. How do you establish that value? Yeah. So we do our initial analysis. So if somebody comes to us and says, hey, we want to look at doing this, we'll do an initial analysis. And uh, we'll look at sale comps and, and uh, you know, soil quality, all the different things that you would that David would do when you're listing a farm for mm-hmm. sale, to try to get a value, uh, idea of the value. So we do that. We put together a little proposal and say, this is kind of what, what we think the value is. This is how many units that you would get for, for that value. Um, and then we agree on a, a price or a value. And then that will be what, what they will get then in, in units okay. coming back. Mm-hmm. So what, what was it like? So I, I know you were in real estate, and then you kind of went from real estate, and any sales guy has to ask or talk with people about uh, money, hard questions, stuff like that. So now you're going out looking for, hey, Corey, I need a million from you, Tanner. I need a half a million from you. And you're putting all these people together. Are there that many people out there that just have randomly another quarter million to throw into farmland? Are you talking about on the uh, just as an investor? Yeah, just as an investor. I mean, we have lots of listeners. And they're like, oh, how do I get into farmland? Mm-hmm. How do I get into farmland? I'm like, guys, you're not even in the game because there's so much money out there. Mm-hmm. What, like, what was that like going out? Did you find a ton of people that were like, yeah, we're interested? Or Yeah, so what we, what we did, um, and COVID really was the reason why we ended up going this direction. Initially, we were going to, uh, you know, Insti- more institutional capital, so okay. universities and, and, and that sort of uh, thing. And then COVID hit. They couldn't. We couldn't do on-site due diligence. You know, they couldn't do that on us. We were everybody needed to shut shut down. And so we thought, you know what, we're going to have to go 
and it's really a blessing in disguise because uh, we, that forced us to go a different direction on, on who we're going to uh, go to and target for capital. Um, and so uh, w- one of the gentlemen on our team, Chris Chardy, is a partner as well uh, in the equity fund. Um, he came from that, that world of, of um, you know, getting capital, uh, institutional capital. So he said, hey, let's go to uh, some of the RIAs, the Registered Investment Advisors. These folks have clients that, that have money invested into, the, into their RIAs. Um, let's go to them and, and sell this farmland. It's a, it's a great diversifier in anybody's financial portfolio. Um, everybody needs to have it. So he started going to them. And, and so that um, really has now been the funnel from where we've been getting our investors. And we're, I think we're real close to 400 plus uh, investors, LPs. And, and that, okay. then th- those channels are where they're, where they're coming from. So Corey, I got a question for you. So you're the farmer of our group, mm-hmm. and there is more emotion in farmland than any other asset I've ever sold. Right. Airplanes, cars, cattle, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So, Wait, you've sold airplanes? I have. I did know that. <laughs> yeah, I Sorry. did. Go For ahead. a guy out of Nebraska, to tell you the truth. Yeah. yeah we, uh, I, I got to think, I mean, I just get pissed off farmers. I get farmers that are mad. So, like a young gentleman at the at the uh, uh, cattleman's deal the other night, he's like, oh, "How do I get into this?" How do and I and I had to give him the harsh news that, "Hey, this is tough. This is an expensive game to be in, and you are going to have to work your butt off." Um, now, you've been doing that, working your butt off to get more and more and more. But you've you've even voiced to me before. You're like, "I can't even compete at this one." I can't even compete at this auction because there's there's investors, and now we have the investor side. I mean, there's a, there's a give and take. What, what's your thought as a farmer? And then Eric, I'll get your thought of what you're hearing from the farmers. So probably ten years ago, when I was getting into farming, I would be one of the ones complaining. Okay, right. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, it's a knee jerk reaction. We are in an area that we have. Uh, we do not just investors in farmland, but investors in uh, real estate for housing and, you know, d- developing cities, mm-hmm. urban urban growth. And it's like someone complaining about $4 corn, yep. right? Like, it, it sucks. We're not mm-hmm. making money. But at the same time, this is the game we have to play in. Mm-hmm. Complaining isn't going to help me or my neighbor or anybody else. So we have to figure out how to play by these new rules. And that's what I try to see the bright side of it yep. and you know meet guys like this and and if you're just going to be there complaining you're just going to get left in the dust well and you might be able to strategize too and and be able to farm it and expand your dollar right mm-hmm. yep yeah it's su- farming is such a capital intensive uh, industry and game to be in yep. and you know when, when when folks look at investors or groups like ours yeah. a lot of times I, I think some pushback that we'll get from farmers is like oh gosh here they come and yeah. they're going to come in and buy all the ground really they need to look at it differently we're, we're a partner. Mm-hmm. We're somebody that can come in with the capital to help buy that farm, to keep you on the farm, and give you an opportunity to even buy it back at some point down the road. You know, we can work out deals like that yep. um, to where if you can't afford to, to do it right now on your own, you know, come, go to the people who are willing to, to invest in with you. Yep. I can tell these boys are excited about the topic today because we are bouncing back and forth. So yep. I'm going to try and recenter us <laughs> just a okay. little bit. Yep. We, we got to the point of we bring a farm in, and we, did, we talked about how we establish bringing a farm's value into the legacy fund. So mm-hmm. we're not talking about the, the investment, investment okay. fund. Now we're talking legacy. Legacy yep. fund focus. We got to that part. Mm-hmm. What happens when a farmer puts their land into this fund? Yep. A couple things. First of all, right off, right off the bat, uh, uh, it's, a, it's called an uh, IRS 721 exchange. And so... Right away, they're they're not eliminating, but they're deferring their capital gains tax if there is any tax there, because uh, they're contributing the farm into a partnership. There's not a, a sale that's technically happening. So they well, so they're still an owner of the farm. They're not an owner of the farm, but because of that 721 exchange, uh, it does not trigger that capital gains event. They're an owner now. Their shares or units are part ownership of the entire portfolio of farms of like kind assets. Exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. So right off the bat, that deferment of, t- of capital gains is, is, a, is a huge, could be a huge uh, advantage for a contributor. So the farm comes in, uh, and we can kind of start talking about the carve-out rights. So if, if that landowner has a tenant or a son or a daughter or a sibling who's been farming that farm, they want to continue farming that farm, we give them the first right to farm that, hmm. that, be the tenant on that farm moving forward. 
Uh, now they'd be a tenant; they'd have to abide by a lease, and and we we're gonna we we're gonna manage that lease just like we would any other farm. Because Sower takes over the management of the farm. Right. Yep. Yep. We're managing the the farm and, and the entire portfolio at the, at that point. So that's one carve out, right? If if they have if there's hunting on on the land that the family's been you know enjoying for decades, uh, we can continue that right as well. Uh, and then finally, if if the sibling or any designated person that, that the family wants to, to uh, designate wants to buy that farm at a later time down the road, they can do that at the then fair market value. Oh, no kidding. So why, it's not like once it's in, it's in forever. Right. Well, it is. We, we are not allowed to. We're prohibited to sell that farm okay. unless we had written uh, um, uh, permission from the landowner, the original contributor, to sell that farm. And we have no intent to f- sell the farm. We called it Legacy Farmland mm-hmm. Fund because it's, it is truly a legacy. It, it's a fund that's set in for per- perpetuity, basically. It's an open-ended, evergreen fund. Um, so we have no intent to sell. Now, if there's a development or something coming along that's going to uh, offer some outsized uh, uh, gain for that particular farm... Of course, we're going to go back to the contributor and say, hey, this is the deal. Uh, we've got an offer that's astronomical uh, compared to what egg land values are. We'd like to sell it. And if they do that, that's another carve out that, that we've got in place to where that contributor will be able to realize that outside, outside gain. So the fund would take you know the, what the egg ba- land value is plus a little bit extra, but then the rest of that value would go back to that original contributor. So that's another a little wow. carve out right uh, that we give to the. So we made it it's, try to make it as flexible as possible with as many options back to the landowner and give them that that control. So who's putting their land in your fund? Is it mainly estates transitioning, or do you have active farmers? Uh, who's, who's the target? Mostly, it's it's estates that are transitioning. That's our our true target. Uh, but our our secondary target market are producers, the the tenants. This is a way for them to be able to stay on the farm. If they have a landlord that they know is thinking about selling, because that's the only option out there, um, this is a way for them to get us in front of them or you know to have a conversation. If this works in their estate plan, we can get that that tenant back, you know, keep him on that farm long term, and again, give him the right to possibly buy that farm down the road if you wanted to. Okay, so I just had a scenario pop in my mind. So if there's a tenant that is going to try and and create the opportunity to stay on that farm. If I have debt against a farm when I put it into the fund, mm-hmm. how does that work? Am mm-hmm. I allowed Good to question. maintain my mortgage, or do we have to, to settle up? Well, number one, we would look at that mortgage and, and possibly want to uh, assume it. Okay. I mean, if the rates are good, you know, especially if the mortgage was set a few years ago, sure. a long-term uh, fixed rate that, that may not see again for a long time, we'd want to look at maybe possibly assuming that. If we didn't, we, w- we have a capital uh, provider that, basi- that, that will serve as the capital if somebody wanted to sell their units back to the farm or to the fund um, that they would take that out and then also for debt if there's debt on a farm coming in um, we would take that capital take out the debt and then the value of their shares would be reduced by that amount by the net amount yeah. okay. so if it's a million dollar farm half million dollar debt we take out the debt they would get half, yeah, million, half million dollars shares okay mm-hmm. is there a way to uh let's say uh, Mom and Dad need to go to home, uh, and Corey had already sold. He's got shares, but he doesn't have cash position in your in your fund, in the legacy fund. But he's like, man, I got to put Mom and Dad into a nursing home. Can I sell just my shares? I'm glad you asked that because I would have forgot this other uh, pretty neat feature of, of the fund. So with your units, we have a, uh, a banking relationship with Farm Credit Services of America. Okay. Um, they can take those units and pledge them and take debt out to, for that long-term care or whatever they need Okay. Uh, instead of selling those units. They sell those units. The basis does carry with those units, so if they go to sell a unit, they're still going to have capital, capital gains capital at capital gains. that time. So instead of selling the unit, they can use those units, pledge them, take out debt, and then with the return that they're getting back, their income that's getting back, that it can be service. used to serve the debt. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so you're, you're borrowing against your... Investment, kind of like a reverse mortgage. Reverse mortgage, yeah. if mm-hmm. you will. Okay, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Yep. Ultimately, not an ideal situation, but if you need to, it's nice to know that there's a tool to do that. Right. Well, and if you sell your ground tanner, you're you're done. If you burnt that money away, you're done. You know, you can't necessarily leverage against wherever you went with your money. And, so. and more likely, you probably paid a hefty capital gains bill. Right. 
yep. doing that. Yeah, especially if you're selling while your parents are still alive. You yeah. Don't, don't get the stepped up basis. Yeah, right. I was just thinking about the 1031 deal. Would this be an easier way to kind of help transfer some of the value before waiting for the death event of the stepped up basis? Yeah. Yeah, because that, that would be an opportunity for a family to transition shares. Mm-hmm while this is happening using some of the carve out rules in mm-hmm. order to protect you know say it's your mom and dad we keep right. using you as an example so mm-hmm. why not, right, just why not? Yeah. Mm-hmm. your mom and dad put a farmland into the fund <coughs> they continue to draw the quarterly dividends yep. off of the fund mm-hmm. for their living into retirement mm-hmm. when they pass away you and your family you and your siblings split shares. Yep. But they get stepped up basis at that time. Exactly. Right. But yep. you split shares, you're not splitting acres. Yeah. Right. Well, and that's, so we're trying to, right now, a lot of people in transitioning go to like trusts and mm-hmm. things like that. And you're making shares and things like that that are easily divided then. This is mm-hmm. not spending the 10 thousands of dollars on lawyers to get a trust and right. do that. Right. Well, and, and there are trusts that, that are looking at this as a, as a tool as well. Okay. Um, because, you know, depending on how that trust is written, uh, I mean, we... If there's shares inside that trust instead of the farms, it actually is easier to divide those shares out than it would be a farm. I just saw a word on our outline that makes a lot of sense as we're breaking down these shares because that can provide you incremental value. The word's gift. Mm-hmm. So this provides an avenue to start transferring wealth prior to death in the form of gifts mm-hmm. and probably still fit with underneath that threshold of value to not but get taxed. If they gifted, that's exactly right. If they gifted it, you wouldn't get stepped up basis at that time. So they'd be better to keep it and then gift it to you after they die or be, uh, or bet, make, make you the beneficiary. Better's a, a, a very interesting term because it, it's going to be different for every single situation. Mm-hmm. And What's there's so experience? many different, uh, there's char- charitable remainder trust. There's different uh, uh, tools out there, uh, estate planning tools that you can put, roll those uh, shares into. Um that have different rules and, and, and ways that they can distribute it out. Maybe the cash is getting distributed out at, during the time of life, and then as soon as death, uh, those those shares then go into that whatever charitable uh, so organization they wanted them to go Here's to. a question for you. Let's pretend that I'm a farmer and I got a really good offer on my farm, so I decided I'm going to sell it. Mm-hmm. But I have some basis there, and I'm going to have to pay capital gains. Now, normally we have 45 days or 180, 45 to recognize, 180 to close on it. Mm-hmm. Can I use my 1031 tax deferred exchange to buy in to no. your fund? No. no. Like kind we, we, asset? We looked into that 10 ways till Tuesday, and there's just no way to use $1031 to go into either fund, either the, the, the equity fund or the contribution fund. It's just, it just can't be done. Hmm. Yeah, believe me, I did the hmm <laughs> <laughs> and talked to t- attorneys inside and out, and just there's just not a way to do it. You think there is just because it's such a like kind. Well, asset. DSTs. I mean, yeah, there's DSTs yeah, out correct. there, and you can roll it in, into something like that. But it, those aren't. I what's, don't know. What's a DST? Delaware Statute Trust, uh, basically like kind for an investment, but you're they're buying farmland or land. A lot of them buy WalMarts, and so you put your million in, you put your million in, and you don't have to you don't have to uh, pay capital gains on it. But a lot of times your money's locked into mm-hmm. those. You yep. you're you're locked in, and now you're just getting a dividend return. So you're getting a lot of them are five percent generically. Um, of course, we can't predict that, but a, a lot of them. You know, a farmland's at two and a half percent. These ones will get five you don't have to worry about it you don't have to keep up with what the price of land is you don't have to keep up with uh, who's farming it manage it here's just your check Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the benefit of your legacy fund as we all get an uh, amber alert. An amber alert, <laughs> man. Right, we should share Somebody trying to steal the John Deere tractor, or what's the deal? Well, it was like Fort Knox <laughs> getting into this area, yeah. like I'm telling you. Yeah. Somebody must have got through the gate. Somebody got through. Uh, <laughs> so as far as your legacy fund goes, it is providing that opportunity for diversification. So if you are highly concentrated in an area and, you know, for example, are looking for ways to provide a more stable future for your investment, your dividend's not based upon how your farm ground performed. It's how the whole portfolio performs. Exactly. Performed. Yeah, that's the diversification and, and, the, and the risk mitigation that that, that offers. So yeah. does this fund have corn and soybean acres and cotton acres oh, yeah. and almond orchards and? Not almonds. Uh, it's a row crop only. Okay. So, yeah, okay. we're, we're not doing any permanent crops or really timber and pasture. Uh, we can make those things work, but, but the primary uh, aspect of that farm has to be row crop. So, so it can be a lot of different areas. It can be a lot of different row crops. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. if it's a, a drought in Iowa and we don't yeah. 
that farm doesn't fare well, but we had really good crops elsewhere. Right. The fund itself could outperform. Yeah. So it, that's what our footprint is on our equity fund and same that legacy. Legacy is new. We're just rolling this out. So gotcha. Uh huh. Um, what, what if I'm, I get lots of calls, Eric, uh, a banker, attorney, uh, somebody that's been halfway successful, and I have a quarter million dollars, I want to get into farmland, mm-hmm. and it's not enough. Mm-hmm. Like, like that's a lot of money, but it's not enough. It's not close. It's not enough. So let, let's pretend that they start investing, um, and and they put a quarter million in this year, and, and then two years from now, they put another quarter million, and, and, and five years deep, they, they, they're they a million deep, and now they could, they probably would have had enough money to buy their own mm-hmm. um, deal, but they've been taking the dividend from yours. Can they cash out? Oh, yeah. can, they, can they pull their million dollars out because Dave has this awesome piece of 80 acres for them that wants to buy? Yeah, so this is on, if you're talking about equity, on the equity side. Just on side, the equity side, yeah. yeah. Uh, they certainly can, uh, but what they w- won't get anymore is that diversification. You know, if they want to Then it's only it their out, 80 acres. That's 80 period. acres in, in the middle of Iowa or wherever it's yep. at, and that's it. And so n- there's nothing wrong with that. But, uh, again, what, what the fund, on both funds, what they provide is that diversification, uh, that risk mitigation of having, you know, farms in different geographical areas with different crop types. Tanner, we, uh, all the other funds that I know that are out there, they buy them and then sell them off, you know, five, ten years down the road. This is the first one that I've heard that doesn't sell them. The legacy. Yeah. Right. So open-ended evergreen fund, and that's the difference. Those, what you're talking about, David, are closed-end funds. Yeah. So you usually have a shelf life of 10, 12, Correct. 15 years, and then they're selling. They have to. They're mandated to sell. And so but when I first originally uh, put together the, the equity fund, uh, that's the route we were going. And I thought, if with farmland or anything in ag, it, that's a long runway that you need to to be able to create for, for people to, to stay in because it, it takes a while. You buy a farm, it, you know, Grandpa always said it never makes sense. A farm will never pencil out the day you buy it. Um, you got a question you know, before I stir our listeners up? I do. Why, why stop at farmland? Why stop at just row crop? Why not go into almonds? Why not go into commercial real estate or things that are returning that would just provide more diversity? Yeah. I, so... You could do that, and there are funds out there that do intermingle. They have permanent crops and row, row crops. Uh, we we feel staying very focused on row crop by itself. Number one, the return metrics for row crop are different than what you're going to see on yeah. permanent crops. And so uh, we wanted to keep that very consistent. Um, you know, if a person wanted to invest in, in uh, U.S. row crop farmland, they can with, with, with the equity fund. And if they want to mix in, they can go. There are permanent crop funds out there but we felt it was just uh, it, made, it made it more pure just to stay in, in row crop and that's honestly what our team knows uh, that's what we grew up in um, and so we wanted to stay very very pure that way okay. mm-hmm. I like that so one of the things that I popped in my brain is you mentioned that once the farmland is in the fund it's professionally managed right and Dave uh, certainly makes comments that wants a professionally managed farm manager gets a hold of a farm typically the roi goes up it does yeah the ability to uh without emotion negotiate leases without emotion the roi for the landowner or the farmer for the landowner okay that's why i'm saying i'm stirring our <laughs> listeners <laughs> <laughs> that's why i'm saying i'm stirring our listeners up because that's the that's the caveat of of who's listening to this podcast is two different groups of people this mm. was our breakfast mm. conversation okay. this morning yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Two different groups of people because we've got listeners that we stated this might be a good way for them to stay on the farm if they've got a landlord, but it also might raise their cost of production because a couple years down the road when it comes time to renegotiate, they're up against a professional farm manager. Mm-hmm. That's going to keep them honest and, and all, yeah. Yeah. Keep, it, keep, yeah. Try not, to, I, I shouldn't say keep them honest, but, but, but keep the, the value of that lease, you know, market. Because you've got a fiduciary responsibility for yes. everybody in yes. the fund. Mm-hmm. To, to maximize that return, which is why if you're a landowner listening, this is a valuable opportunity for you to, without emotion, increase your ROI. Mm-hmm. Right. It just I know we're going to have listeners in both categories, and, right. it, and it will stir them up. Mm-hmm. Do you have uh, examples of farmers that have increased their acres, though? Oh, yeah. By yeah. working with you? Because, I mean, it, there, I think there's advantages for the farmer, too, and it's it's let's increase our acres and, and widen our swath, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, in this day and age, I mean, acres and, and having acres to farm is, is the whole key, right? And 
um, if you want to ex you know, expand, there's there's only so, so many ways to do that. Uh, other, you know, either have substantial amount of capital you can buy the farms that come when they come up for sale, or you partner with groups like ours. Um, but you know, I can see there being you know maybe some dissension there between landlord and, and a professional farm manager. Uh, but in this case, if it's a way for them to expand their acres. There is some, there's got to be some give and take there. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple different types of farm management. There's the kind where I'm determining uh, when to market the grain, what you're putting in the ground, uh, what tillage practices you're going to do. I'm a lot more hands-on. And then there's I negotiate cash rent. Mm -hmm. I, I am basically a conduit, communication conduit between uh, the land, uh, the guy that already knows how to farm it because he's been doing it a lot longer than I have, mm -hmm. and the other a lot of farmers that I have, like, look, kid, don't come in here and tell me how to farm the farm that I've been farming forever. Right. Uh, do you want to help them negotiate cash rent? What's fair? I'll have that conversation with you. Right. What What kind of management do you do? Yeah, so we're we're cash rent only. Okay. Uh, the only we we take no risk in production. So, okay. uh, and there's a couple different reasons for that. One, when we develop these funds, we want it to be as uh, the the least amount of risk and possible for our investor possible. and stable. Maybe not as sexy. Maybe we aren't catching, you know, the, the, the high returns in the years that things are going well, uh, but it's stable. And uh, however, we do in, in most of our leases have a flex provision. So if there happens to be an outstanding year yield wise, price wise, uh, we do have ourselves or give ourselves the ability to participate in that ups, uptick. And that's actually been pretty good for us the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, no, we do not uh, uh, participate in any do kind of Do you think your flex is going to kick in this year, Corey? I'm just thinking it. We need the flex to go down. <laughs> mm -hmm. if, if, if you want to share in that, you should share in the go on the downside too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not planning. When we set our, our our strike prices and things a couple of years ago, we're not you know we're not going to be hitting those probably this year. Yeah. It, right, yeah. The way it looks. So. So if we do have listeners that are looking to expand their operations, how do they w work with Sower to potentially be the tentative choice? Well be you know be the ones to contact us and let us work with the, either the landlord uh, or if it's a farm that they own they want to do a sale lease back we'd love to visit with them and you know just like That's any, any state or any state yeah we, we but row crop specific U, u.s row crop yeah row crop for sure um oklahoma and north dakota we cannot absolutely be in those states okay. but but uh, why but pokes and bison <laughs> <laughs> crazies <laughs> right. <laughs> right right yeah so it did the is that Corporate farming laws in those states okay. just to disallow us to, to be in, in those areas. Well, I think North Dakota's legislative sessions only happen every other year anyway, so probably hard to get that changed. I just learned that. Can you believe that? Politicians only have to meet in person every other year in North Dakota. Well, they just got their crap yeah. together, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so here's I a question for you. Do you can, can China invest in your fund? Uh, no. 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 There's there uh, If any foreigner wants to participate in our equity fund there's that's pretty there's a pretty strict uh uh procedure for them to do that and it's it's actually too costly for us to even to consider them to come in and to be honest with you we want to keep this American. the reason i ask is because it gets asked to me all the time is oh, china sure. gonna buy my farm are they gonna buy my farm it's, as an investor they're gonna buy you know it's the hot topic right now and, yep. and honestly i think if, if you dig into it a little bit it, it's not as drastic as anybody. it's not nearly <laughs> as bad as people make no, it out to be no maybe a little blip Barely, but so what do you see the future of Sower being? Do you see the fund continuing to grow? Is there going to be Sower 2.0? Yep. Uh, no, there won't be Sower 2.0. So the equity fund, both funds are open ever, evergreen funds, so they're meant to, to continue on. So our, the, the, the idea and the objective on the equity fund is to continue growing that portfolio, continuing to um, you know maximize returns on the farms. So we're doing CapEx projects. We're doing whatever it takes on those farms to maximize its yield. Uh, not only the commodity yield, but then the yield, obviously, through the cash rent lease that's coming back to us and then eventually to our investors. And on the legacy fund, uh, it's to, again, grow that, uh, you know, as there's a need for people to, for succession and state planning, um, which is, we think is, we're just at the tip of the iceberg of, of a lot of land transitioning hands here over the next 15, 20 years. Uh, we just want to be that option or an option for somebody to look at if it, if it fits their situation. How do you guys get get paid? You have a lot of operating costs and, and people, mm -hmm. you know, doing the deals and all that. It, is it a fee, a set fee? Yep. Or, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. So on our, our equity fund, uh, we, we uh, there's a 95%, or 95 basis point uh, management fee. Um, and then there's a little bit of a, a management fee that goes to our outside managers. So, uh, so about 1%. And that's about what it is on the legacy fund as well. Okay. 
Legacy funds a little bit more complicated because we have what they call IDRs, their incentive rights. That, that, that's how we will eventually get paid based off the, the performance of, of the fund and the assets that are in them. But when it's all said and done, uh, it's about 1%, a little less, up to 1%. Okay. Let me be the devil's advocate for a second. What uh, uh, I see a lot of guys that are like, ah, just tough times right now, balance sheet doesn't work. Let's do one of these programs. I'm going to buy it back. Mm -hmm. And they have this very confident stance. You're laughing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to buy it back. Yeah. They never buy it back. Right. Yeah. Is, 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 why do guys not buy it back? They, they, they made bad decisions and got out of it? Or, or do you help them get back? Yeah. And, you know, there, there's, there's, there's really uh, innovative ways to structure a deal, you know, on the onset. If somebody's looking to, to sell a farm and wants an opportunity to buy it back at some point, you know, we can, we just actually put together a deal where we have the, the um, tenant or the seller participate as a, as a part investor in, in that deal. So there's ways to, to get them involved, have equ equity in that farm, uh, and then to have, you know, how are we structure the, the buyback? There's a lot of ways to, to put that together to make it, uh, you know, conducive for them to do it. We'd have to go in a quick, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to do it. But, uh, I just, I'm rolling around in my head. And I, yeah. I've got smarter people on our team that help come up with the, you know, ideas that, that maybe sometimes aren't out there. What's the stat, Dave, that uh, the percentage of land that's owned free and clear? 82%. In Iowa. Is that Iowa? Or just yeah, just okay. Iowa. It's about 75 across the Midwest. 75% of all farmlands paid for. So you're probably only working with that 18%? No, not necessarily. No. No. Yeah, on the sale leasebacks, that that would be part of that eighteen yep. percent for sure. But when we're talking about estate planning and and the legacy fund, you're, most of these farms have no debt on them. Right. Uh, you know, they're they're doing wanting to do something like this for for other reasons. I could definitely see it being a value for, you know, people get removed further and further from the farm as it gets transitioned down, and they might have a tech job out in San Francisco or whatever, mm -hmm. but they don't want to sell it mm -hmm. completely or still want to have some of that tie. It, and these guys <laughs> can actually. Uh, tie that back. Yeah, so I just brought up a, a question that I don't know if we got exactly down clarity on is three siblings. Mm -hmm. One wants cash now. Mm -hmm. This is a tool that provides the opportunity for cash to the one sibling and the other two can retain ownership via shares. Right, exactly. They'd have to hold on to those units for at least a year or else they're going to cause a, a sh short-term capital okay. gains which you don't want to... But it provides know. a planning tool. Even, right. though they, yep. even if it's 12 months delayed... We still know that the one sibling can liquidate their shares. It, it exactly, and okay. that was really the the genesis of of, of putting. So say 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 that again, because I think it's going to my question, and maybe I missed it. I was my number one client is brothers and sisters, and inevitably the parents always put. I'm going to say the smarter kid in charge mm -hmm. of uh, of being the executor no, of the estate, or maybe it's just the, the oldest, <laughs> it's, it's uh, the, the older one, the favorite. It may one. not be the smartest. But so but most of <laughs> the time, in my family, I am all three of those. <laughs> most of the time, the person who is the executor of the estate in my world. They're, they're wealthy enough. They don't mm -hmm. need the cash. And it's always the one that, that maybe wasn't the person who's in charge that like, ah, I want to force my brother's hand to sell. I need the money. I need the whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. Even my scenario, I got other siblings uh, in my wife's family. They're going to want to cash out. I, I yep. guarantee they're yep. going to want to cash out. Yep. And that's what you're talking about, Tanner, yep. is basically. wait a year. Mm -hmm. They just got to wait a year, right. and then they can cash out they of the fund. Liqu liquidate their shares mm -hmm. a year into the, the program. Is there any way to help? Me as the third wheel, so I'd like to buy it out, but I don't have the cash right now. Mm -hmm. I am trying to position myself to be able to, in the future. Like mm -hmm. I'm trying to find a way to use your tool mm -hmm. to f 10 years from now, if my in-laws pass, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to buy out brother and sister. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that this helps me as the potential investor mm -hmm. to get ahead of that? Yeah. You can either buy those shares out from that sibling or 10 years down the road, if you wanted to sell your units to buy the, the farm back, you can do that. So, is that an, I mean, is that an answer your question? So, there, there's a lot of things you can do uh, with yeah. those units. How about this scenario? Say I'm a farmer and I think I know it all, and we're at thirty thousand dollars. We're saying, yeah, yeah. Your say house. we're at say Dave, <laughs> <laughs> Dave just sold a farm for thirty thousand dollars yesterday an acre, mm -hmm. and we're at the peak. You know, things are going to reset. I think, mm -hmm. right? We're going to go back fifty percent, forty percent, and I sell into this fund play in the game fair market value mm -hmm. that in 10 years or whatever that this oh. thing could be worth half mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then i buy it back mm -hmm. is that 
a possibility? So I'm going to take a stab at it, yeah, right? go ahead. Mm -hmm. I assume that's just fine based upon the value of your farm at the time you buy it back will be compared to the value of the shares in the fund. Right. That's exactly right. Overall. Mm -hmm. Expand. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And, you know, there will be, will be stipulations in that, in that buyback uh, agreement that's going to, uh, you know, put a floor on it for us. Yeah. You know, we, we, we can't take that kind of risk for all the other investors in the fund to sell a farm back to a uh, original contributor or their designee uh, at less than what we, you know, brought the farm in. And we just can't. can't what if it does go backwards though? We have another eighties and we go back to Legacy. five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. It's in mm -hmm. there forever. It sits in the fund forever. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it'll just it'll it'll keep generating its its return over all those years. There's going to be up years and down years. Historically, farmland doesn't go down, and if it does, it isn't for very long. Right. Um, uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, they'll continue getting their income and, and the appreciation over time. So give me, we, we've talked a lot of different directions. We've talked this way, that way, um, and our listeners are probably confused by now. <laughs> give, give me a top five list. Uh, so we're fun. Why? Yep. Well, on the e equity side, it's, it's a, a, again, a, a great diversifier in anybody's uh, financial portfolio, in, in their investment portfolio. Uh, that's number one. And that, that actually covers both funds. And minimum to buy in is? On the equity fund, yep, yeah. So if it's coming through the RIA channels, we we have investors that are that are fifty thousand, okay, fifty k. Uh, but if we're if an individual is to come to us and invest, and they certainly can, um, we'd have to look at the individual and kind of what 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 the situation is there. But we can probably, I think, our our some of our lower end investors are probably around two to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And you can't give a return, but generically, is there a ten year five percent or? Yeah. So our so far uh, our performance has been we've been beating NCREF and so uh, our IRRs uh, over a 10-year period are above the 8%. So, wow. um, yep. And that's considering appreciation and income. the income. Okay. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So listeners, we got equity, investment. Diversify. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Diversifying your portfolio. Right. Do you have four other top five? Well, on the legacy fund, there's all, I mean, I can, I can finish it out yep, right sure. there. So, uh, uh, you know, the capital gains deferment is a huge deal. Okay. Um, you know, making that asset, which is monolithic, hard to deal with, transact, the only thing really your option are is to sell if you want to do anything or gift it. Uh, it putting it into units and shares Easier just gives you that, that flexibility to, to split, to yep. gift, to, you know, and not have to do the whole entire farm. You know, you can do little, little part or, you know, your shares, you do parts here, parts there. Um, so that, that, that type of flexibility. Um, and then, you know, back to the, the farmer. I mean, our, our goal or one of the goals here is to keep farmers farming. And okay. so um, we want to see tenants continue to grow. And, and we see this as a huge opportunity for them to, to do that, to, to maintain or retain acres that they that they have that they're farming and and to grow it over time. That's good. I don't even have to summarize. Do you have a uh, range or a target ROI uh, for rent coming back? Like a lot of you know, you talk yeah. about a lot of two and a half, two and a half percent. percent. Half, so like most five, of my investors, know, I think, and that's, want. And you know, on the legacy, our our floor is is two percent net, and so after our fees and, and that that that's kind of where where it has to be. Um, on our equ equity side, we're, we're doing better than that, but we're also you know. The farms that we've got so far in that fund, some of them are uh, we've been able to put cap, you know, do some capex to them and and actually increase those returns. So whether it was tiling or irrigation, uh, we developed a, a farm down in Georgia that used to be a timber farm, and because it was timber, we were able to get an organic tenant on it right <laughs> away, instantaneous. So you can you can imagine the the higher rents that come off that, uh, and we were able to buy it a little bit cheaper put the infrastructure in. Uh, so we're able to do those kind of things with, with farms within the portfolio. So that helps us boost the returns there. And uh, Do you ever have sharp guys like Corey, like, hey, I want to expand my operation. I rent ground now. Um, just call your, your fund and say, how do I become an operator? Mm -hmm. I want to be an operator. And here's five of my people that I already operate for. Maybe they would be willing to sell or, or, you know, I mean, you probably have that when they want to sell. We don't want to lose our ground. So mm -hmm. that's, I guarantee they'd call you then. Mm -hmm. But do you have guys that are forward on that to try to just be your operator? For that, that's exactly what, one of the reasons why I, I, and I appreciate you guys having me on, on your podcast here, because that's exactly the audience we want to get in front of, along with the tenant. I mean, this is a, a way for, people don't know about this. This is brand new. Yeah. Uh, 
You don't see it in ag. You see the 721 exchange in other asset classes. So it's not, the concept isn't new, but it is in ag. And so uh, we would just appreciate getting in front of those folks and be able to offer this solution or this opportunity for them as well as, as a tenant. Uh, so, so how do they find you? Right. So uh, you can go onto our website, legacyfarmlandfund.com. Okay. Um, and, and on there, are, we have a phone number on there. I've got my own personal cell phone number. I'd be glad to give out. It's 402 1044 uh, but again, you can find pretty much anything and everything you need to know about Legacy on our website, LegacyFarmlandFund.com. You got anything before we wrap up? He kind of summarized it for us, yeah. did my job for me, so I'm going to put a challenge out there to our listeners. And, it, and I'm not, I could just cop out and go, go to the website and challenge them to go look that up. But I want to challenge them to have the conversation mm -hmm. with a landlord that they feel is potentially going to cause them issues down the road. Everybody has that landlord that just popped in their brain that you think of, God, that as soon as they die and it goes to the kids, I'm never going to get to I'm farm screwed. this again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Start today. Right. Plant the seed saying, hey, I want you to listen to this podcast. If your landlord's old and you need to go pull it up on their phone for them, start the conversation. That's it. That's my challenge. Yeah, yeah. have that tough one, that tough mm -hmm. conversation, because if, if we, they we, go and you didn't, you're going to just kick yourself. Yep. Mm -hmm. well, and this could be a really easy way just to say, Hey, I wanted to share this with you. I found this conversation yeah. to be valuable. Not yep. that I want you to be dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not that I want you to die. But, but it's going to happen. Yeah, for we real. all die. Yeah. We're not getting out of here. However, alive. I'd like to keep farming your farm, yeah. and your kids probably yeah. don't know what they need to know about it yet. This would make it shares for mm -hmm. them yeah. mm -hmm. rather than acres. And then there's also a third party management yeah. company making sure I'm giving your kids a fair deal, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a pleasure. I'm glad that you were able to uh, get behind the curtain here at Commodity Classic. Jump in while we're fresh. I know by the end we do these interviews, <laughs> we'll, we'll probably have mush for brains. Yeah. So I apologize for the last one that's scheduled. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this was, was a lot of fun, and I'm glad that you shared what you've developed with our listeners. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and one final thought, if, if I can, and you kind of touched on it, just get started. Have the conversations with your, with your, your estate, your succession and transition planning. There's so many people out there that haven't even thought about it, or they have and they just prefer not to mention it or mm -hmm. talk about it just get started talk to your cpa your attorney your estate planner folks like you guy i mean just start start the start the process mm -hmm. that's good fair enough awesome well listeners until next time have a good one <laughs>